Welcome back to the On the House podcast. I'm Alex Blue Moon with Rochester Homes, and I've got Tyler Anderson with me here this morning again. Hello. And Jesse Flynn's back. How's everybody doing? Jesse Flynn again. Flynn again. <laughs> <laughs> we want to follow up today on the podcast that we did from Fabulous Las Vegas, where we talked a little bit about. International Builder Show and some of the cool stuff we saw out there, but we put a bookmark in two topics and we're going to pick up one of those today, which is heating and cooling, one of my favorite topics, personally. But we <laughs> Yes, it is. We'll keep it to a real cursory <laughs> overview since some of us are true HVAC professionals. Maybe one day we'll get a HVAC professional on here to, to pin the tail on the donkey. But for now, we want to just do an overview and talk about systems and how modular comes into play with them. But first, I want to cover a few topics from either previous podcasts or just news in the industry that we've, we've seen. So, uh, Tyler and I did a podcast about other building methods. We talked about panelized, modular, and site-built. Sl- slab. I think you broke it down by slab. By yeah, we talked foundation types. Right? D- different, different code types is yeah. I thought we would kind of break it down by. Right, right, right. Um, I, we didn't mention that there's like some other new technologies out there. Some new and some not so new. So like a new technology would be 3D printed houses. Yeah, I want to talk about one day, but I don't know enough about it right now. I've it's, never it's even like heard of it. It's incredibly <laughs> emerging technology. I don't even know that there's five 3D printed, printed houses in the country yet. But it's, it's an interesting topic. Foldable houses. There was one at the Builder Show that yeah. was a foldable house. Now, what's a foldable house? Is that like it comes on on a carrier and it just kind of folds out with four walls? And you Wait, you it? guys, you, I thought you were in it. No, he didn't see it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, you guys never no, saw I walked, it. I walked through with a couple of our builders. And oh. It was really, I hate to like <laughs> be negative and pick on another company, but it was really half-assed. I thought it was ridiculous. Like to spend the kind of money it would take to go take a house to the, to the Vegas Builder Show. I can't imagine. And then, like, to market it properly and to bring people through and treat them properly and give them the proper knowledge. I can't imagine the amount of money that this company spent. And they had plastered all over their walls that the home was $35 a square foot. And, of course, you know, people are walking through, oh, my gosh, $35 a square foot. We can build a house for $235 a square foot. Or, you know, even a rural area, people are $135 a square foot is an entry-level home right now, you know. How in the world are you guys doing this? And so we we asked the salespeople, and they were like, "Well, keep in mind, you know, this is a foldable structure, so like that's just the structure. Like, oh, still, I mean, okay, you know, think thirty five dollars a square foot for framing, drywall, you know, floor. Was it was it drywall? Uh, no, it wasn't drywall. It was it was another material, but there was like you could tell where the seams were. And the hinges, if you see the hinges from the Yeah, I thought they left those undone for a reason, the hinges. Well, I think what they're, at least I took it from the salesperson I talked to, it was like $35 a square foot gets you exactly this. what you're seeing. I got you. But then I was like, oh, but you still have cabinets and stuff. And he's like, no, 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 it doesn't include cabinets. Like, so you got to hang the cabinets on tight? They're not even included in the $35 a square foot. Like, your own cabinet. So it's just the shell. Yeah, so it's $35 a no. square foot for a shell. Like, what about delivery costs? Well, you got to figure that too. All right. Okay. So the step up from panelized. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be like going into Ford, who's having a sale on on the new F one fifty for twenty thousand dollars, and finding out that you're buying a carburetor. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's that outrageous. Oh, there's no roof. The, the roof's not included. Oh, I thought the roof was included in the hinge. No, you totally have to build that outside. There is a hinge on the up in the ceiling. Nope. The the ceiling itself. The ceiling hinged, but there was no roof. Oh, you're the saying that the, the pitch, like to get the pitch on the roof, you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ceiling, oh, I got you. Yeah, okay. Like top cord. Why would they even advertise something like that? I, I mean, that would just upset you. Yeah. It's like walking the door. The minute they told me that none of that was available, I would be walking right back out the Well, door. and then you guys <clears throat> happen to know me and how I can be a little bit of a smart ass sometimes. So I like to really start to quiz the guy on like, how it's shipping, how it's stacking, like what components are coming in, what kind of freight they're pulling in. And he didn't know much about it, you know, 
God love him, but he's like, let me take you over to my product guy. So I'm asking him those questions and truly want to know the answer. And he was like, well, we're a startup, so we don't really know the answer to that question. I'm like, well, you guys have built some of these. Obviously, I'm standing one of your models. And he's like, no, no, this is the first one. This is it. Oh, really? Yeah, this is the only one they've done. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so anyways, foldable houses, 3D printed houses, concrete houses, another technology that we didn't talk about the other day. And that's a little bit, that's been around for a while. So yeah, I, we'll, I, I think you that. can get concrete. I actually looked at that in the cookbook. You can do concrete prescriptive stuff, but I don't know anything about concrete houses. <laughs> yeah, so you can do like a pre pre-built, pre-cast stuff. Uh, or you like have uh, so block. energy efficiency stuff with it that you'd have to work through. In other news, I happily found a little a little tidbit in a, in a neighborhood covenant the other day that made me smile. So historically, at least since I've been around here, Modular has fought with neighborhoods because... Some of the covenants say stuff like, no building or structure shall be moved onto a plot. Or it says, you know, basically you can't trailer in anything other than raw materials. Mm -hmm. That's what a lot of covenant boilerplate stuff will say. So, like your, your brother calls it residential racism. You know, they're, they're dictating in a neighborhood covenant that you can't bring in a code or excuse me, a house that's built to the same exact code that all the other houses are built to just because it was built in pieces off-site. I think what they were originally trying to do was keep manufactured housing out of neighborhoods, but what they've unintentionally done is kept modular housing. I mean, well, all sure. the country. Yeah. Which, yeah, takes yeah, back, county, yeah which, which takes us back to the conversation we had a, a few weeks ago, which was, you know, 80% of the building that's done, in the, excuse me, 93% of the building that's done in the country is site-built. And out of that, a vast majority is done by track builders and neighborhood developers. And, you know, why isn't modular getting in, into a bigger market share? And that's part of the problem right there is lack of education and stuff like boilerplate uh, verbiage that keeps our type of construction out of, out of neighborhoods when it should. So anyways, I saw this. This covenant states, no building or structure shall be moved up to a plot. Provided, however, prefabricated housing consisting of pre-constructed structural building components, which when combined on-site with other building materials, results in a building or structure which meets all the requirements under these restrictions shall be allowed. That's, awesome. yeah, that's, that's on yours? <clears throat> Excuse me, yeah. This that's is, in your neighborhood? No, no. A builder sent me this the other day. I wanted oh. to make sure that he could put our houses in his subdivision. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I was psyched to see this. And this, this I, as far as I can tell, is about 10 years old. So I was, I was really shocked to see it. And then it goes on to say, all residential structures must conform to the city of X building codes, single and double white mobile homes, and any other manufactured housing which is not subject to local building codes will not be permitted. Like, whoever wrote this, hooray. Like, congrats, good job, thank you. It's exactly how I would have written that. Thank you for educating yourself before writing up your code. Now, sounds, what it sounds like is they came to a tour when I gave it. <laughs> now what? Now what happens if you take a uh, a Hudgler type, so built <laughs> built to the state code that is a three twelve <clears throat> roof pitch? It's a thirty or a twenty eight by seventy six. No, these, these have a minimum minimum square footage and a minimum roof pitch. A minimum roof pitch. Yep. Okay, but let's say the roof pitch is a five twelve. Can't be in this. In this oh, situation, in that situation. Well, I mean, what if you run into a situation where they don't specify the roof pitch? You bring in one to the state code. It looks like a double wide trailer house, thirty by seventy six. I mean, do you think that's part of the problem? Why you get those boilerplate uh, covenants going on? I think that the intention of the subdivision is to provide conformity. So that homeowners don't lose value of their housing as new people bring in new product. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it sounds like they wanted some kind of conformity to, to be affordable housing, yet a 
certain quality standard like a six twelve growth pitch. Mm -hmm. I mean that's not common. Most mm -hmm. people most most of these that I've seen require a five twelve. So these guys, in my opinion, were are covering to be their a bases. Step above a small step above pure affordability. Yeah. So in the instance that they weren't trying to do that, let's take a brand new neighborhood and they say five twelve growth pitches are great, or even four twelve is great because we want to build an affordable community. As long as you're building this to the residential code and you're hitting the standards of, of you know, you're conforming to the standards of the covenants, what's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. You're going to have like housing in that neighborhood. And the point is you're not going to have some guy brings in a 312 and dings his neighbor's property values. Yeah. It just depends how um, the depth you want to get into. 312, you know, do you want to do a, a four inch eave? Uh, a little yeah a lot of time eve restrictions do they yep. a four inch fascia I shouldn't say a lot of time I'm sure some that have eve restrictions yeah as long as it's got a three inch vent pipe coming out the roof you're good it's built to the state code you know yeah I mean I hear you great lines in other news <clears throat> um, I read an article from Robert Dietz he's part of the NHB Ion Housing um News feed, and he's saying that according to fourth quarter 2018 data from the census quarterly starts and completions by purpose and design report and NHB analysis, median single family square floor area ticked down to 2,316 square feet. Average square footage is down to 2,567. He goes on to say that basically this is a this is a sign that we could be tripping towards recession. Because you're going down square footage? Yep. Based, I mean, well-written article, check it out. Do you have any other data on square... Like, what was square footage in uh, the housing boom? It's got to it's be well above the 2567, right? Yeah, I didn't put a link. That'd be, that'd be interesting numbers. I didn't, put a link. I didn't put a link in the <laughs> article, so I can't get to it really quickly here. But he says, I'll just, I'll read a quick snippet because he does a lot better job than I'm going to be able to do with summation. So the post-recession increase in single family home size was consistent with the historical pattern coming out of recessions. Typical new home size falls prior to and during a recession as home buyers tighten budgets, which is what he's saying is going on right now, potentially. He says, and then sizes rise as high-end home buyers who face fewer credit constraints return to the housing market in relatively greater proportions. So during a recession, when people who don't have to rely on banking and financing to get to build a new home, those people typically build bigger homes. Home average average and medium home size goes up as a result. But aren't aren't you seeing aren't you seeing like I, I'm always been hearing, especially from you, that you know, the millennials especially, they want less square footage with higher end amenities. I think we're talking more about people's income and their credit ability to purchase Right, them. but they're based, he's basing that data off of square footage. Right. Square footage of the buyer. So we're not seeing a lot of lower income... People purchasing homes is what they're saying. So no, no, he's saying that people's budgets are getting smaller because people's budgets for building their new homes are getting smaller because they're holding a little bit more back in their pockets because they're preparing for bad times. So all, all he's saying is it's on everybody's mind. Right? No, I yeah, I think that's definitely on everybody's mind. Based, especially cause I've had even a couple builders ask about that, but I just I'm. My curiosity is coming from the, the understanding the whole square footage, how that can you can correlate those two things. Well, let me. Okay. Let's, I'll finish what he says, and then maybe it will tie together. He said this pattern was exacerbated during the current business cycle due to market weakness among first-time home buyers and supply-side constraints in the building market. So, markets weak among first-time home buyers that would be millennials. Mm hmm. Um. But current declines in size indicate that this part of the cycle has ended and size will trend lower as builders add more entry-level homes into inventory and the custom market cools. Did that answer your question any better? No. Not really. <laughs> Does that answer your... I mean... Yeah, I think I get what he's saying. He's saying 
he's not saying it's a cause, but he's saying as people tighten their budgets, they're going to buy less square footage. Yeah, yeah, but you can't. Can you base it just on square footage? I mean, you could. You can pack a lot of options no, into no, no. it. He's, there's a million other factors out here. He's saying this is one sign that everyone who's reading the tea leaves and saying that there's a recession coming, this is one sign that they could be right. Hmm. That's all he's saying here. Yeah, it seems a little silly to me. Okay, let's talk about the conversation from Vegas. I want to start with <laughs> the little white wedding <laughs> Yeah, Jesse, what, what happened uh, there? I knew this was going to be brought up. <laughs> Little White Wedding Chapel, well, we uh, we got to experience that, for sure. Chrissy and I ended up getting married in Vegas and uh, got pictures with the owner's dog. <laughs> Friends Way. <laughs> Friends Way, yeah. Beautiful poodle. White it was poodle. awesome. Yeah, it was, it was fun. It was a good time. Alex uh, thought had, it was beautiful. Had a really, sure. <laughs> really cool driver that took us there, brought us a, a few cocktails while the wedding was going on. So <laughs> it was a, it was an interesting day, but a great day for sure. <clears throat> oh God, you, Tyler, your wedding's gonna be that. Yeah. Oh yeah, it? I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, Bethany's not listening. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Jesse's married. Got married in Vegas on the strip at the Little White Wedding Chapel. Wait, that was on the strip? Wasn't that on the strip? I don't know. Uh, it was right down from that, what's that show? <laughs> uh, Pawn Stars. Uh, <laughs> I remember I guess, going... Yeah, I guess I don't know where it was. Yeah, it was right down from Pawn Stars. So it's, it was off the strip a little bit, but not, not too far. About maybe a 10 minute drive, <laughs> if that. Is that everything you dreamed of? Was the Little White Chapel everything you dreamed of? Actually, yes. I mean, the choice that you get from room to room, you know, we picked the best room, I think. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, uh, well, they let I you mean, pick that room? Yeah, you know, oh, I, you, they, I thought it was really funny. They play the wedding song, but it, I mean, the aisle that you walk down is literally 10 feet, so it's like you hit play, <laughs> which they really hit play. It was like a cassette. <laughs> they hit play, and then you walk for... A second, and they hit stop, and it's like there, there you are. You're ready to go. With so. the guy that hit play was wearing gold framed glasses. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was incredible. Took great, yeah, took great pictures though. Good pictures. Did you got <laughs> mm-hmm. the back. Oh yeah, and he was oh, late. He, he was late to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but good times. Good times. I thought it was a nice ceremony. But the referee did a good job. Yeah, we know, Alex. We saw, we saw the tears coming down your eyes. It was beautiful. A- Alex was crying the whole time. It was a beautiful ceremony. It's we, like, Alex, get yourself together. It was honestly, <laughs> yeah, it's like when you watch Vegas Vacation, it's literally, that's literally how it is. This is that ridiculous. Not regret? not saying that's a bad thing. <laughs> you, regret, you regret not having Elvis do it, though? Uh, no, actually... Having the owner that's that's done it for years, and she's done a lot of celebrities and a lot of cool people, uh, I thought that was really neat, actually. We looked, she married Britney Spears, Michael Jordan, Mike, Michael Jordan Bruce Willis, there's a couple other, mm-hmm. just, uh, Sylvester Sloan. Yeah, huge names. Yeah. Yeah. If any of those are listening, you know, feel free to send in some autograph garb to Jesse for a for a wedding gift. That's right. Since you guys got married in the same place. Just Except saying. I think Britney Spears lasted for like 52 hours or something. See, you already beaten up. Yeah. <laughs> An annulment. Yeah. Okay, so we had our first angry caller. Angry got, caller. Yeah, I got a phone call <clears> the <throat> from, from somebody that was mad. I know, I know who this is because I actually talked to him at my house one night. So Wait, what? I thought it was pretty I funny. wonder what that email was about. Well, I don't know that I sent an email. About well, no, he did. It was about an angry call, about the podcast. Oh, and yeah, angry yeah. He lives up to his nickname. Yeah. So, he is in it, it's a buddy and he was kind of joking around. But he's like, he's like, you're just dead wrong. You're dead wrong about, we're, I think we were talking about ductless mini split systems and how I... I'm geeked out by him. I think like they're the future, you know. Well, he stopped listening before he called me. He didn't let us like finish out and get to the point where I admitted that the world's not the the American Northern Hemisphere world isn't ready for him. 
Well, I think I'm pretty sure I explained that to him when he came over that night. I don't think he listened to the rest. Right, he stopped. He yeah, I it. talked to him and talked it through, and he's like, he's like, you guys are completely wrong. I was like, I don't think you understand. We we said that it's not quite there yet, but we could see it in the future happening. Yeah, and, <clears throat> and he, what was his? Did he tell you what his argument for the best system was? I don't think so. I don't recall can, that. Can Can you talk names here? So I decide for my own. It's Blake. Oh, it's Hardesty. Okay. Yeah. Hardesty was upset about. He does a lot about HVAC. Well, the I reason he does is yeah. because this new house that he just purchased, he's been having trouble with heating, and you know he had to get a fireplace, and oh, okay. So he's he's actually looked into a lot of say, different. That would, that would be my last guess. <clears throat> really? I was like thinking like Ben Hoover, or like somebody that's in the business, you know. No, we need to get Hoover on here though. To yeah, that would correct be... us all the wrong stuff we're about to say. I, yeah, I, I'll text him. Yeah. Okay. So, anyways, he said, in his opinion, <clears throat> a heat pump with a gas forced air furnace backup is the best system in the world, which is the same thing I would say today. So, anyways, we're on the same page, Blake. Don't call in and give me shit again. Did, so, what? He called <clears throat> you all pissed off? Huh? He called you or you? No, he well, called I'm Alex, but I, I'm pretty sure he stopped by the house that day, that afternoon. So that's you know, funny. I had a couple glasses of apple juice with me. And <clears throat> well, okay, yeah, so let's just, let's just real quickly cover, not real quickly, but let's cover the main heating systems that are out there in our country today. First being, you know, just conventional forced air system. Well, around here I see a lot of those outdoor sheds where it could be wood burning or... Uh, corn. Yeah, I wasn't even talking wood burning. I guess yeah, you're right. Let's start Just, with wood burning. Yeah. Well, wood burning. They they. I mean, in the Midwest here, we see a lot for the winters, especially where they have sheds that actually are a wood burner and they push air into the house. So it's a separate unit outside and it's not even inside the house. But they have inside units too. <clears throat> Correct. Yeah. So you could do a wood burner, generate your heat off of. Yeah. Sounds miserable. I actually, is this kind of, does, it, does it smell all the time? Uh, well, I mean, I have a wood burner. I have a wood burner in my house, and I, well, Chrissy and I both love but yours the is, smell of the burning wood. Yours is yours doesn't go into like a, a a trunk line or anything. It doesn't go to a trunk line. But what I've done is I put a you know a sixteen by twenty four return air up high in the ceiling, so it, I can just turn the fan on on my. My furnace, I and it will circulate the air throughout the house. Oh, okay, so the trunk line is the main line that's typically underneath the house that takes hot air from a furnace or cold air from an air conditioning unit, and it runs it to all of the floor ducts, and yeah. then that blows up into your room. That's it's, what it's the thing you see in restaurants when you look up on those big modern restaurants that it's the pipe that gets smaller as it goes down the... Down yeah. the rafters. Yeah, I like to tell people like go swimming at a Holiday Inn pool, an indoor pool, and yeah. look up, and you'll see that big circular tube. And every twenty foot, it gets a little bit smaller, reduces in size. Why does it do that? Static, Static pressure. pressure. Static pressure. So, in a modular setting, why don't trunk lines work? Why don't they? Yep, they do. Ships from the factory. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, I would say that majority of competitors will have a trunk line that starts on one side of the house, and then it wraps around the perimeter of the house. So it's going to be turning three times, mm-hmm. and then by the time it gets to the end bedroom, the static pressure is really low, but the very beginning of the trunk line is going to be really high. So you're talking about a with a truss, like a truss floor. Yeah, pretty much it all. It's it's just a trunk line that stays the same size, and it goes around the perimeter of the house. It, okay, so that, that, let, me back, let me back up first of all. Okay, so we have shipping height requirements in the modular industry. We can only ship homes that are a certain height. So in order to get around that, we've hinged our roof system. So we fold our roof down, basically, and then we can ship an 8-foot sidewall or a 9-foot sidewall house on a 2 by 10 floor system. Mm-hmm. That two by ten floor system can either be a joist or some kind of truss system. Now, some manufacturers have taken a step further 
and have gotten rid of the network of uh, like cross members in the carrier that takes transports the modules from our factory to the job site so that they've got another, uh, how thick is that tether? 12, 14 inches? Yeah, probably 12. 12 inches? Yeah. So they've got, you know, 12 inches that they could attach a trunk line underneath the 2x10 floor joist and they can ship it there. But regardless, nobody in the industry is has figured out a way to ship, you know, a 24 inch tall or an 18 inch tall trunk line at the start. So if I'm coming directly off my furnace and I'm going to go 76 foot away from that furnace, I've got to have a big volume of air right next to the furnace. So I want a trunk line that's, I'm, just, I'm going to throw out a random, like 24 by 24, let's say. And that's huge. Uh, that's my, yeah, that, you're going to see it. Okay, give me, your, give me a realistic one. Then. I mean, typically you're going to be a wider, you know, so, you know, maybe a 12 by 12 by 24, I guess. Okay. Yeah, you're you're going to be higher to the joys. 18 yeah. by 16, whatever. Yeah. The point is you have to have some volume right next to the furnace. Mm-hmm. And then as you get further away, let's say in 20 foot, you're going to see one reduction. And in another 20 foot, you're going to see another reduction. And the point is that the pressure within that whole trunk line is going to be the same right next to the furnace and 76 foot away at the very last point of that trunk line so that the air blowing into the room comes out at the same exact speed and with the same exact pressure and with the same exact amount of heat, theoretically, or cold in, in the theory, yeah. summer, in, in, in any bedroom in the house, regardless of how far away it is from the furnace. Mm-hmm. So, back to Jesse's, what, what you were saying. Yeah, we, we started on opposite directions there. Yeah. I was starting at the worst, and you were starting at the best case scenario. Right. So now, <clears throat> so now our industry has a habit of doing what you're talking about, Jesse. Correct. Where it goes around the perimeter of the house either in a, a truss floor and it stays the same size and then it loses static pressure as it goes through so the static pressure at the beginning is going to be really high and at the end of the run the static pressure is going to be really low so if you want it hot it's going to be hot in the front room but at the very end room it's going to be cold vice versa oh, yeah and the only way to fix that is like adjust your just your floor registers. Right. Or or if you're on a if you're like on a simple twenty six by forty eight house and your furnace is somewhat centrally located, you can make one of those systems work okay. Right. Well what unfortunately like what some of our competitors do is they run those trunk lines Jesse's talking about either around the perimeter or they run like two trunk lines that are the same size. Yeah. And they connect them all together. Right. So like there's just So they're there's still all no one. Way, yeah. You're talking about one competitor. No, several. There, there, there are several that do that. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, for instance, like what we now. do. I mean, we've stepped up to the plate and made it a little better from what we just explained. So we have four main dunk, duck lines, and then it spiders off from there. So the static pressure's the same throughout the house. But we really only recommend that on like really small crawl spaces, right? Yeah, right. because yeah. we're doing we're doing a truss yeah. floor. Well, it right? actually works decent on a. You, well, you lived in one, a twenty-eight by fifty-two. Yeah. Basic ranch. I mean, it, it worked okay, right? Yeah. Other than the return air yeah, issue. Yeah, it was but, a small crawl space out. But we fixed the return air problem, where we do a return air out of every bedroom. Yeah, yeah. At that time, we were doing one return air, and it could suck your hat off. Two, two. On. Did two big ones. Two, like, 16-inch. Yeah, monster. It just slammed all your doors. So, anyways, like, that that basic network from a modular setting, in our opinion, doesn't work unless you're on a, a small crawl space house. Anything else, especially basements, we recommend doing it on site so that you can size your duct appropriately. Per and the floor plan. And that's the big thing is everybody wants to make a general like rule of like this is how you should run a heating cooling system where you need to look at the floor plan in general and, and then design it around that, around what you have. I feel like we have a misconception especially internally where it's like, well... This is how we did on this house, so that works for this house, and that is just not the case. Especially when you get into two stories and story and a half and things like that. But that's a whole other subject. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, so then conventional conventional heat is gas forced air, maybe with an AC unit outside, depending on where you're at in the country. That's that's the most basic system above burning your own wood, right? If you're going to rely on gas, or you can get a gas furnace, gas force air furnace, you can get electric furnace. Mm-hmm. What was, uh, who was touting like the new 97%, 97.5% efficient? It was Linux, wasn't it? Linux had a new 97.5% efficient gas furnace at the show. Oh, really? Yeah, it was 
pretty interesting. I mean, 95's been like the rule for about five years. Right. So that was pretty cool to see. So then the next, the next step of, above that in efficiency, you start to get into heat pumps. There's two types of heat pumps. You can do an air source heat pump or ground, ground source heat pump. Ground source heat pump is what people call geothermal. And then air source heat pump is what, you know, people just call a heat pump typically. What do you have in your house? I've got an air source heat pump. Weren't you having problems with it? For What I don't like about it, okay, so we live in the Midwest. It gets down to negative 20 sometimes, especially during polar vortex. I don't know what, negative 45 this year. You can only suck heat out of air when heat exists, right? So air source, meaning I'm taking all my heat from the air. It's, it's taking that heat in. It's then turning it into warmer, warmer air than even the, the surrounding temperature it's taking it from. And then it's, it's running that through your duct system and heating your house with it. So what you're saying is when it was negative 30, it, there was no hot <laughs> air out there. So right. it just doesn't but do anything. And these temperatures, 40 to 50 degrees. Yeah, so so from what I can tell, it, your in, introduction cost is going to be 500 to $2,000 more than just buying the AC unit. So my theory is, you know, if you've had a decent piece of equipment that's, you know, five hundred to a thousand dollars more than an AC unit would be, but you can run all your AC like you would with an AC unit, and you can run heat from, you know, let's say sixty degrees. You turn your furnace on typically, so you can run heat from sixty all the way down to twenty degrees with that really efficient system, that air source heat pump. You're going to gain that thousand dollar entry cost back in a matter of maybe two, three, four years at the most. So in my opinion, there's no chance, very little chance that you don't get a return on your investment. And that's why I say, if you're currently doing a furnace, look into the cost of doing a heat pump, spend a little bit more money up front, have a much more efficient system, get your bills down for the next you know, 15, 25 years until that piece of equipment breaks and then you have overhead to fix it. That, that's my opinion. What I don't like about my current system is that there's an electric backup. So once I get down to 20 degrees, I've set up my thermostat to switch over to my backup system because it's no longer pulling out air, or excuse me, heat out of the air. And my electric furnace backup, as everyone knows, electric heat's very expensive. Mm-hmm. You know, so I see my bills just absolutely skyrocket if the temperature's under 20. So I would say if you put a gas furnace back up and you're spending gas money to heat your house afterwards, you get a twofold benefit. You get the benefit of one, spending a lot less than you are in electric heat, and two, you suddenly get that like, you know, hot air coming out of your vents. So that's that's an argument against heat pump systems or you know, mini splits, is that they're spitting out, you know, 85, 90 degree air, whereas a gas furnace is spitting out, you know, 125 degree air, and it's really heating up the room quickly, and you feel nice and cozy, and you don't, like, have a constant chill. That's that's kind of some of the arguments. And, and the guy at Linux was talking about that mm-hmm. when we were at the show. Yep. What, what do you see your bills, like, when you're about this temperature? I mean, are you fairly efficient? I don't want to talk about that, Tyler. <laughs> it's bad. It, oh, at this... At like 40 degrees or something. Yeah. I'm sorry, I was thinking winter. Um, well, everything on my house is on electric. Uh-huh. And I can see... Right now it's tough, but... I mean, I can see like $125 for, your, for my entire electric bill. That's, that's not bad at all. That's... I've got three kids running around with lights on all the time. My wife has an inability to turn off lights... Mm-hmm. Something in her DNA. I don't know if your parents raised you to not turn off lights, Tyler, but they did with her. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a high, so 125 bucks a month. That's not bad. Yeah. It's not bad. But, but when the electric kicks on, what's your bills? Well, in the summer, it's really low. Keep that in mind. It's really low. My average is like 250 Okay. For, that's all my electric... That doesn't sound terrible, no. but keep in mind my summers are really good, <laughs> right. so my winters can be really, really bad. Yeah. No, I'm about to say, well, I'm actually not the same. It just kind of flip-flops, because my furnace is gas, 
but then my AC is electric. And you don't run your furnace a ton, do you? I don't run my furnace a ton. You got a wood burner. Yeah. So since I got that wood burner now, I mean the winter is next to nothing because I'm always burning wood. But then the summer is outrageous because my AC unit is just running constantly, it seems like. Well, yeah. and yeah, and, you, and you're not real well insulated either, are you? Oh, I got everything. I, I mean, two years ago, I got all the exterior walls blown, and then I put oh, you cellulose in the attic. Yeah, okay. How'd they do that? They you, just, didn't rip off, you didn't rip off all your siding, did they? Nah, well, they didn't rip off the siding, but they, what they did is they just zipped the siding and pulled it up a little bit, just bored holes yeah. up, up top and then down below. So two holes each bay pretty much. So they'd fill the Was bottom it foam? and then go to the top foam or the, the rest. Foam or the uh, insulation? That insulation. Use, like that we use to the ceiling. Yeah, so you yeah. 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 I still, that's, that's crazy they can do that. But yeah, there's a few things that I need to get done to make it more efficient for, you know, insulating the windows a little better, the exterior doors and... So. Yeah, so like you're you're a perfect example of someone. I would say like if you if you have to or when you have to go replace your AC unit, you know, look at heat pump technology because you're going to get a more efficient cooling for yeah. sure, and then you're also going to get heat until you're at again 20 degrees. Now, go ahead, you were about to say something. Well, I was just thinking. I think I'm I'm prime as well because my house is smaller, so I don't have a whole lot of square footage, so I could get something to where. I have a bigger unit for the main area, and then two smaller units for the bedrooms that we use. Yeah, you're talking about ductless yeah. mini splits. Yeah, now. you jumped ahead on me. Sorry. I'm talking about <laughs> conventional trunk lines still, conventional you know heat guts. Your, your trunk lines are all on your ceiling. Uh, yes. Well, all my return airs are in the ceiling. Your trunk lines in the slab then. Yes, huh. they're the. I mean, my house is so old. That's when they had the clay boots oh, or, or the okay. clay runs to the yeah. boots in the in the floor. So it's pretty weird. I put ceramic tile on my floors in the bathroom. So when you go in there in the winter, the floor is really warm because all the heat is running through the floor. So it actually, it's kind of. I nice. didn't realize that. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so we were talking about. Um, we were talking about that, you know, that threshold where my my thermostat switches me from heat pump to, uh, you know, gas force air or electric force air in my case. And Mitsubishi and uh, I think Fujitsu both just came out with a heat pump that they say will efficiently heat your house down to negative 30 degrees. Negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit now. Which takes me to my next topic of if they're that efficient, if we're heading that direction, that's where I start to argue with Blake's point. Like, oh, he, you know, heat pumps are the best thing in the world. That's when we're going to switch over mm-hmm. to ductless main split systems. Because at that point, you don't need a backup. Well, and, and that's what I'm saying. I have that wood burner, so that is my backup. Yeah, in your case, you got a wood, wood burner backup, but I'm saying in my case, if my heat pump would take me down to negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit, mm-hmm. there would have been two days this year, total freak days, where I would have had to put a couple electric heaters in my house. You know, and most years, that never would have happened. Right. And yeah, I never would have had to my electric, electric furnace. So that's that's kind of where we cross I, I, Yeah, I don't understand how that works, though. How that's even possible. I don't know. It just doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they're pulling warm air out of freezing, like air that's so cool that your weatherman saw and you stay inside. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I doesn't. I don't quite understand that. I don't know, but I gotta believe they're smarter than I am. So yeah. Um, so then, then uh, ground source heat pumps are instead of pulling directly out of the air, they're running like either an open loop or a closed loop system into the ground, either horizontally or vertically. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. Bottom line is like if you don't have a bunch of land and you got to go vertical, you got to drill down. You can get really expensive in the drilling and the installation process. Or if you have a bunch of land, you can you know you can do horizontal, which from what I understand is a little bit more cost effective. But the point is, it's a very expensive system, like potentially you know five times more expensive than the install on a conventional system. Geo. So, yeah, geo. Ground source heat pumps, geo. 
So it takes a lot longer to get your return on investment. So the, the argument I've heard against that is by the time you get your return on investment, you've opened yourself up to your in-house systems breaking down and you've got to replace those and you never really realize that game. So we've seen, at least in our network of building, we've seen the geo numbers drop drastically in the last few years. And I just got to wonder if that's because the heat pump technology continues to get better and better and it's, and it's so much less expensive to install in the first place. Are you hearing that from Southern, Southern Illinois guys, Southern Indiana? Or where is that coming from? Um, yeah, probably more Southern guys. I would say the state of Michigan on the whole is still stuck yeah. in conventional. Yeah, they're stuck in a lot of yeah. other ways. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's so ground, ground source heat pumps at a, at a glance. That's, I guess, the argument against them. So then to get to the mini, ductless mini splits... Get rid of all the trunk lines. Get rid of all the supply lines. You've got a head unit in each room. Like if you've got a, let's say a three bedroom, two bath house with a, a living room that's open to the kitchen, you'd have a head, a head unit in each bedroom and you'd have a, head, a bigger head unit in the living room that would cover your main living spaces. Those could all run to one outside unit and that's gonna both heat and cool your house. And each one of those can be controlled individually. What's what's the I, what's the cost dif- I mean, what's your cost difference for doing a conventional system? Um, from what I've found, it seems like you can do twenty five to fifty percent more to get into a ductless mini split system now. It's not terrible, I guess. So downsides are visually you've got head units on your walls. And well, they're making that, like Linux had a system to where it would go to, like say you have two bedrooms, it would go to a main unit in the attic, and then you would do a small duct to each bedroom ceiling, which at that point, that's not terrible. I could live with that. Yeah, yeah. That, there was, there was like one that. where it kind of recessed into the attic, and it was just, you know, where you can control it. Yeah, it was like the, what they call a <clears> cassette. Something like that, yeah. And it looked basically like a big... Remember the old whole house vent fans that were like, what, like two and a half foot by two and a half yeah. foot? It looked kind of like that, but like a little more modern. Well, the, the one I'm talking about is actually, it would just be a, literally like a register in your ceiling, but it runs off of a main unit in the attic. You're, oh, you're talking about the one that you really didn't see anything other than a boot. Right. Because I'm on board, though. I, I think they look like shit, the, those big units the in the ceiling. Units. I don't like them. But that's personal preference, I guess. No, I think the I think the consensus is that Americans don't like them altogether. Yeah. Like apparently, in Europe, the technology is way ahead of what we're using it at. And one one answer is because we don't like the way it looks, apparently. And then the second reason is back to that cold heat thing. Like again, these things are blowing out heat. That's you know maybe eighty five degrees. You can put your hand up there, it just doesn't feel warm. It's going to keep your house warm. You're going to be able to heat your house to 70, 72 degrees. But like in my case, you know, all my life I've lived in houses where we kept the, the thermostat at 68, 69, 70, maybe at the absolute highest. We keep ours at 72 now because it just doesn't feel warm until you get up there. Gotcha. So that's, I mean, and they can't, I don't think they can fix that. So I just, 72, I wonder. 72, huh? I know. Wow. Yeah. I know. I'm I like know. 67. Yeah, I'm 68, 69. You're getting old, man. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I guess I don't have an argument. I think my that. grandmother's house is colder than 72. But when you walk in the house, you don't feel like it's 72, though. <laughs> right? What's that? Uh, you feel like it's 72 in my house. Well, I don't know. <laughs> you do? I, I guess I've never noticed. Maybe your kids leave the doors open. That's very... My dog leaves the door open, too. That's true. Yeah. When she goes outside... She can, she can let herself out, but I have yeah, to train uh, herself to... Ellie May knows how to, how to open doors. Yes. Well... Like, big dog. Because, she, yeah, she she's, weighs more than me. What haven't we covered? We, that, was a, that was a pretty broad overview of HVAC. I didn't want to get down too far in the weeds today, because, like I said, none of us are experts. We'll have to bring a, a Hoover or a... Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing for me, from a monitor, well, from any perspective, uh, is the, is eat from a conventional heating standpoint, is... Uh, duct sizing, especially on on two stories, 
or anything multi-level. And I, yeah, I think we need to get like a Hoover in here. I, I know, I know the general consensus of what we need to do in the plant, you know, as far as prepping for it. But past that, you know, I'm not no expert by any means. I think I think the biggest reason we started talking about this was because of the profession that we're in and how it could benefit the future of modular homes. Yeah, which we really haven't talked about. We've just been talking about the benefits and oh, what the negatives are. to it. So, I think what really started the conversation was the fact that if they could somehow in the future make it more efficient and it pull be able to pull more warm air to actually heat the house, that would be one way of us eliminating something that has to be done on site by a builder, and we can do here. Or instead, or is that our problem with our industry right there? Yes, is our this builder is where base? It starts. I just, our builder base is too afraid. They want to sell an out of the box product. I let the fuse people. They want to sell an out of the box product. They want to make it look like it's a residential house, but they don't want to do anything on site. Well, I I can see why you would think that sometimes, but we're having labor problems. Everyone in the industry is having labor problems. Yeah, but labor's problems aside, look look at you the past fifteen look years. At like look at the past fifteen years when we didn't have labor problems. Okay. You know what I mean? I mean, it is what it is. I'm just saying for the future, if labor problems continue to persist, yeah, and we can do more at the factory by getting rid of trunk lines and introducing a nice looking, efficient. Right. No, I, I went on a different system. rant there that was I, more I broad, more broadly based than that. I, I think that this ductless system could could work for us in the future and help our builders. Uh, but yeah, I, I kind of got a little off track there. <laughs> <laughs> based off, I mean, don't get me wrong. We have a lot of great builder base out there that that is very capable of really adding to what we build and and make it really look like a nice home uh but there's a that that could be a whole other subject we talk about all uh, all day yes i mean speed too is another another factor there like again get your house there set the outside unit yeah you know you gotta charge the lines plug it in and go you know that takes some time off building you know building trunk lines on site installing a furnace Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, I think the bottom line is we don't believe the technology is where it needs to be yet. No, not on a not on a readily available like mass producible scale to the point where we'd be ready to get into it with our product. But we're keeping an eye to the ground on it. But the price got there. I think you got to focus on price first. Well, and I think we're decent at focusing on return on investment. You know, we don't yeah. offer. We don't offer spray foam insulation in the sidewalls because we don't believe spending, you know, um, five, seven thousand dollars per house on your sidewalls instead of getting, you know, our normal R twenty one craft faced, mm-hmm. you know, uh, bat insulation is going to provide enough of a return on investment to get that money back for our homeowners over the course of, you know, a reasonable amount of time. Right. Well, plus, so, it just doesn't work with our systems anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can make it work if you really believe in it. Yeah. And the bottom line is, we don't, so we don't make it work. So, keep an eye on return on investment and overall technology, and we'll see where it goes. The other thing I'll close with is, um, you know, we're on Spreaker. Post your comments, thoughts, questions about the show. Um, I know we have. Judy from Laporte who's posted some stuff. Thanks, Judy, for listening. And we will try to get uh, she wanted to talk, you know, wanted us to talk to an appraiser on the show, which I think is a great idea. So we'll see if we can line that up one time for you. Um, also, you know, iTunes, I'm sure there's other ways to uh, to get to the show as well. So you know, listen in, share it if you would.